Laurie Shulman for our free coffee talk. Everyone, we appreciate you braving the stock show crowds in order to get here a half an hour early, and we apologize for starting a few minutes late. Some days that it's just something you can't get around. Okay, did everyone get a copy of the program? If you did not get a copy of the program, would you please raise your hand? Wow, this crowd is good. Excellent. Yeah. All right, you turn to your program page. The, this is my. The first thing that I would like to point out to you is that we have a minor change on today's program. We are opening with the Dohnani Serenade. We are continuing with the Torina Piano Quartet. The Piazzola is changed. It's still going to be music of Astor Piazzola, but instead of the Invierno Porteño, arranged for piano trio, we are going to have a piece called Le Grand Tango for cello and piano. And that will conclude the first half, and then after intermission, we will hear the Brahms Piano Quartet number three in C minor, opus 60. First thing I'd like to ask Gary to explain is our title, The Orient Express to Argentina. And before I turn the mic over to him, just remind all of you who are not veterans of Agatha Christie's famous novel or the movie that we, many of us, know and love, that the Venice Samplo Orient Express was a train that traveled from London to Paris Venice, Rome, Prague, Budapest, and then eventually to Istanbul. There was an older one in the 19th century and a newer one in the 20th century, but it's the idea of uniting Western Europe with Eastern Europe and what we now call the Middle East, but what used to be known as the Orient. How does that have bearing on this program, Gary? Well, it's very interesting because I, as a big fan of the Western and Eastern culture have to tell you that when I was a young man with the New York Philharmonic, we went on tour in Istanbul, and we stayed in a hotel that overlooked the bridge that was known as the gateway to the West because the so-called Orient started right there. So I have first-hand experience of what it feels like to be on basically the Orient Express. Now, why is this program called the Orient Express uh, to Argentina? Basically, if you look at the program, we have the Dohnani bookending with the Brahms. So those are our Western European representatives. But in between, when we have Joaquin Turina and Astor Piazzolla, the Argentinian and the Spanish composers, those are the ones that are basically connecting us with the Latino culture. And so while the language of Turina and the language of Piazzolla could be more different, it's very much a journey from Europe through Latin America and culminating back in Hamburg in, in the cold winter of Hamburg. Specifically with our European composers, I would argue that they're more Central European. Dachnani was, of course, Hungarian, and Brahms spent a lot of time working with Hungarian musicians. Eduard Remenyi, a violinist he toured with when he was quite young, and then Josef Joachim also had Hungarian roots. This is the fellow for whom he wrote his violin sonatas in the wonderful violin concerto. And Joachim, of course, played many of Brahms's chamber music. So Brahms was keenly interested in Hungarian music, and to Western Europe, Hungary represented the East. There are parts of Hungary that were considered the Orient in the 18th and 19th century. So it's a little bit of an affectation, but at the same time, I love Gary's idea of bookending these two Spanish-influenced works of Turina and Piazzolla with the two works by our Central European composers. Dohnani is a composer who's actually been a frequent appearer on Chamber Music of Society, uh, Society of Fort Worth programs. Over the years, we have heard both his piano quintets, his sextet, and this uh, string trio. But this is a particularly special performance of the serenade string trio for reasons that I'm going to let Gary explain to you. It has to do with our guest artists. The Diaz trio, which most of you know, is one of the great string trios of the world. And when they recorded this very Dohnani serenade, they immediately got incredible critical acclaim. And what's really remarkable about it is the critical acclaim didn't just come from record producers and from people who write about it, but it came from colleagues. I'm one of those colleagues. And I have to say that way back when, when I was a Juilliard student, um, there is a very famous uh, radio station called WQXR. <laughs> 
and they would have a show called Through the Night. And I remember after practicing, I turned on the radio just kind of to chill out, and what's the first thing that I hear but the, this very serenade. And I didn't know any of the players because obviously in the old days you can't instantly look at who's playing and, and all these things. But what I was struck with was the incredible commitment to the performance, the, the phrasing, everything was etched. It was like someone was telling me a story. And of course it was the very group that we're going to be uh, listening to today. So the Diaz Trio is very much identified with this piece and I'm very, very happy that they're going to play it for us this afternoon. There are two kinds of serenades. There's the kind where a fellow sits with a guitar or a mandolin beneath the lady's window. And there's the 18th century kind, which is alternately known by the name of divertimento or cassation. You'll hear that uh, term sometimes. And that's the type that Doc Nani was writing. It's a multi-movement suite with an emphasis on dance movements, but not exclusively dance movements. The example that I've chosen is the uh, third movement scherzo. What I'd like you to be listening for in this first example is what key are we in? Doc Dondi makes it very unclear. He won't settle into a tonality and he was a tonal composer. So he's playing games with our ears. It's very skittery, nervous music. It's clearly fugal in its texture and it's very disciplined writing at the same time that it seems to be sprawling all over the place. May we hear example one, please? <laughs> your attention in those rare moments where for three notes he has all three players in unison. This music is immensely difficult to play and it's also really fun to watch because you actually see the musical material being passed from one player to the next. And the intimacy of the string trio uh, ensemble is something that is a very special thing to watch. It's not at all like a string quartet where we sometimes have the feeling that the first violinist is first among equals. All three of these guys are going to be working equally hard in this piece. Okay, because our time is tight, I would like now to move to Joaquin Turina, who was one of the great Spanish composers of a Spanish Renaissance that flourished in the early years of the 20th century. Spain had a very rich history in Renaissance music, and then it was mostly importing composers like Scarlatti and Baccarini from other countries for quite a long while. But in the early 20th century, four Spanish geniuses all of a sudden just burst on the scene. Manuel de Falla, Enrique Granados, Isaac Albenis, and Joaquin Turina. Turina was the youngest of them. What these four composers have in common is two things. One is they were all pianists, actually three things. They all went to Paris, and that's where they met each other and decided we really need to be celebrating Spanish music. Gary, I know, is a special fan of Turina's chamber music, and specifically his violin piano pieces. Tell us what draws you to this music. But the interesting thing about Tarina for me is that he makes an amalgamation between the folk music of Spain and the structure of a classical composer. So this will be a great example for you to listen to the first theme, the second theme. In, in many ways, it's, it's, it's very, very uh, structurally sound, and it's one of those things where you don't notice it. And why? Because of the gorgeous melodies. Tarina is one of the great melodists of Spain, really, of, of Europe. I, I think of only maybe Dvorak as somebody who's, whose melodies just seem to roll off his tongue. And when you listen to the tunes, you can actually get completely sucked in and enveloped by the tunes. But what I'd love for you to do is to also listen to the structure of the movements, because while it's very free in its melodic content, it's actually very disciplined in the way it's put together. The quartet we're going to hear is actually the uh, most highly regarded of all of Turina's chamber music. It is unusual among his pieces in that it's essentially a piece of absolute music rather than being programmatic. It doesn't have a subtitle like Sen Andalus. 
Andalusian scene or something else that evokes a specific landscape or a specific atmosphere or a specific dance. Yet you will hear some Spanish flavor to the music, but he's not intending to tell a story or anything like that through the music. Uh, as I said, he was a pianist. He made a sensational debut in 1897 at the age of 15. It was uh, a, a great, great triumph for him. And the piano writing is, as you would imagine, decidedly brilliant here. But what I love about this piece is the marvelous balance between material, the way he shares the material between the pianist and the strings. Uh, the first movement opens with a slow introduction. My example from the Turina uh, is at the tail end of the slow introduction and the bridge into the main theme which dominates the entire first movement. I'd like you to listen specifically for the interaction between the piano and the strings, the give and take and the exchange of themes and accompaniment. May we hear example two please? simple idea, <laughs> just going up a little bit and then coming down a little bit. But he's going to milk that idea for all it's worth right down to bringing it back at the end of the third movement because this is what we call a cyclic piece. But he changes that theme a lot in a process that uh, descends from Franz Liszt called thematic transformation where the theme could be embellished or varied or stretched. It might become a slower theme, it might change its rhythm or its meter, but the same motives pervade the entire movement. Now that particular opening, did you notice how the pianist would do something and the strings were accompanying and then their roles would reverse? That will continue throughout the entire quartet, but that particular movement doesn't sound very Spanish. The second movement, on the other hand, does. Uh, I'm going to play you a part of the scherzo, but I do want to point out to you that this second movement has two lento sections. So he's basically fusing the idea of scherzo and lento into one single movement. In the next example, which is from the scherzo, you will hear that decidedly Spanish flavor. It's vivacious, it's energetic, and both the piano and the strings are imitating the Spanish guitar, but they do so in a completely different way because this is essentially a percussion instrument and the strings are bowed string instruments. Let's listen to example three from the Turina Scherzo. instruments can strum, literally, but the piano can't, and yet the piano sounded just as much like a guitar as the strings did there. Uh, tell us what this is like for the string players. Well, in rehearsal, it's very interesting because in a movement like this, one of the challenges actually is, first of all, not to be covered by the piano because that instrument, while Tarina knew it, obviously Mozart did not. And so the, the decay that you need sometimes for the strumming for the pizzicato sections, you gotta be very dry with the, with the pianist as well. Um, one thing that I do think, and this is somewhat going to, towards Piazzolla, uh, Piazzolla was known also for an instrument that's, that's kind of special, as, as did actually Dovnani, and that is the bandagnon. And the kind of instrument that is, is both in some ways a percussion instrument and a sustaining instrument, and we'll get back to that in a minute. 
Actually, I would like to move on to Piazzolla now because it is the Hispanic music that rounds out our first half. As I mentioned earlier, uh, for those of you who arrived since I started, we do have a change on the program and it is the Piazzolla. The work we're going to hear is called Le Grand Tango, the Great Tango. It's from 1981, it's rather late. It was one of Piazzolla's latest pieces. He wrote it for the great Russian cello virtuoso Gregor Piatigorsky. And he sent it to, oh, excuse me, I beg your pardon, he wrote it for Rostropovich. I'm sorry, I've got my great Russian cello virtuosi mixed up in the brain. Piotrgorsky was very good, yeah. He wrote this piece for Rostropovich, who did not add it to his repertoire until eight years after Piazzolla sent it to him. Piazzolla wasn't hot yet, I guess. But the American cellist, Carter Bray, who is the uh, principal cellist of the New York Philharmonic and incidentally has a duo with our guest pianist today, Gabriela Martinez, he found the score, Rostropovich showed him the score and he wrote to Piazzolla and he said, this is a masterpiece. And he was one of the piece, people who was central to bringing this piece to the repertoire and Rostropovich of course did start playing it. It uh, starts out with really aggressive scraping on the cello and then just moves into a vintage Piazzolla tango in the center of it. Before I play you an example, I'd like Gary to just tell us a little bit about Carter Bray and his association with this Piazzolla piece. Well, I have an association with just about everybody, as most of you know, and Carter Bray is no exception. Besides being my colleague in the New York Philharmonic, he and I had a piano trio with one Christopher O'Reilly. And I remember when we worked together, the, this Le Grand Tango kept coming up, and the reason for that is Mr. Bray won the Rostropovich competition, and Slava himself was talking to Carter about this piece. So one, one of the things that, that's most exciting about this piece of music is its sort of vocal quality, and Lori will tell you more about it. Actually, Piazzolla will tell us about it because we're going to hear an example in just a minute. But I, I would like to point out something that Gary and I discussed about Piazzolla. It, one is that Johann Sebastian Bach was an enormous influence on him, and he put a lot of fugal textures into his tangos as a salute to Bach. But another thing that they share in common is that Bach did not always indicate what instruments he intended for his smaller ensemble pieces, or even the larger ones. Uh, for example, with continuo, you might have a viol, you might have a cello, you might have a bassoon, or you might have the old-fashioned instruments called teorbo or lute. But with trio sonatas, where you have two higher voices, a cello and, say, a harpsichord, the two higher voices could be violin and flute, or they could be two violins. It wasn't written in stone. Piazzolla was much the same way. He did lots of arrangements of his own pieces, and he sanctioned arrangements of his own pieces for other instrumentation. What's special about this afternoon is that we are hearing it in the original. He wrote it for a great virtuoso. We have two great virtuosi playing it. And I'd like to just give you a little taste, an appetizer for Piazzolo's wonderful tango style. This uh, is example four, please. wonderful writing, especially from a composer whose own instrument was the bandoneon, which for those of you who aren't familiar with it, it's sort of a button accordion that's a cousin to the concertina. But Piazzolla had a secret weapon. Part of his Astor Piazzolla quintet was a fellow named Jose Bragato, who was one of the earliest jazz cellists. And I think that Piazzolla got a lot of input from him about what would work on a string instrument. Well, the last composer on the program, we've been moving forward chronologically through the 20th century. Now we're going to look back over our shoulders deep into the 19th century with 
my favorite composer. I think Brahms is pretty high on most people's list. He is another composer who has been, uh, had made frequent appearances via his music on this series. The Opus 60 Quartet was published much later than the more famous G minor Gypsy Quartet, Opus 25, and the gorgeous A major, Opus 26, but it actually has roots that go back even earlier. And I'll tell you a deep, dark secret. It started in C sharp minor and wound up getting moved to C minor, and he wrote a couple of different movements for it. He got some advice from a very good violinist friend of his, and that would be? Joseph Joachim. And Joachim, of course, gave Brahms a lot of input on the violin concerto, on the sonatas, but uh, it was very important to him. And also another friend that Brahms got a lot of good input from was a woman named Clara Schumann. She corresponded with him both of their entire adult lives when they weren't living in the same town about the music that he was writing, about the performances that she was giving both of his music and of her husband's music. And there's a lot of really interesting letters about this particular piece. Uh, I think that Brahms will essentially deliver himself uh, its music of weight and import and profound emotional content. The story of this particular quartet is relayed in your program notes, and I would urge you to at least glance at them during intermission. I don't like to repeat what's in the program notes because you're all literate people. But I would like to point out some musical things about the example that I've chosen, which is from the development section of the first movement. It's a big movement. Listen for big chords in the piano. Brahms was himself an excellent pianist. He played the premieres of the first and second piano concerti. Those are huge pieces for the keyboard. He knew what he was doing at this instrument. Listen for nobility and power. And after a bit in the example that I have uh, clipped for you here, you'll hear that kind of power in the strings as well as in the keyboard. One last thing I'd like you to be listening for is something that the Greeks called hemiola. The idea, Gary, could you explain what a hemiola is, please? Well, the easiest way to think about a hemiola is a change of meter without actually indicating in the music. So if you have three against two or two against three, you get a different emphasis in the middle of the bar. But what's interesting about Brahms' music, and I think that's where you're going with this, is that he often lets the two <laughs> compound meters live happily together in different instruments. So you, you might have the three against two with the strings against a piano, or even the, between the two hands of the piano. And that's something that, as a musician, you always want to emphasize. You don't want to hide that, because that was the composer's intention. So let's listen to example five, please, and be especially listening, the movements in three, four, for how the triple meter superimposes into three groups of two in a couple of places. stuff, as I said, muscular, big, big music, enormous gestures, but it has an emotional heart to it while never compromising the formal structure. This is the beauty of Brahms for me, is that he never fails to touch the soul, but at the same time, he has a way of following all the rules and still making it sound as if he invented them. Final comments on uh, the Brahms Piano Quartet? Well, I think we should let the music speak for ourselves. Thank you very much for today, and we look forward to seeing you at the next concert on March 29th. Right now, we look forward to welcoming the Diaz Trio and Gabriela Martinez. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.